alternative energy. That's the big buzzword these days. Alternative energy is a popular topic of discussion. And now alternative energy covers everything from solar energy to, to wind energy to geothermal, uh, tidal energies, whatever. Anyway. Solar energy, though, is a major player in the overall green theme. As a rule, solar energy can be broken down into three major categories. One is passive. In passive solar energy, and this is something that humans have used since the caveman days, really. They just didn't know what to call it. Passive is the sun is used to heat a thermal mass, such as concrete or a big rock, or other massive object, and then heat is drawn from the object as it cools. You know, you might have a brick home, and uh, uh, you might notice as you're in the wintertime as you're walking by, it's been a bright sunny day, that there's heat being liberated from the, from the side of your house. But technically, that's passive uh, solar energy. Uh, obviously, it's a little more complicated than that, but not too much. Another type is active. Active solar energy involves the sun heating a fluid. Water, uh, if it's cold enough, it might be antifreeze, but anyhow, water, uh, some other form of liquid, uh, even air, really, but water and antifreeze are, are the, typically the ones you hear about the most. But these require mechanical pumps to pump the heated water, the heated fluid, whatever it happens to be, through a heat exchanger. And then heat is extracted via this heat exchanger and fans and whatever. Hmm. Last is photovoltaic. That's the one we're worried about. This uses solar cells to produce electrical current. Now, the term photovoltaic, again, comes from photo, which, which means light, and a voltage being produced. As with a lot of engineering uh, concepts, a lot of technical concepts, there's good news and bad news. First, the good news. There's a lot of energy from the sun striking the Earth's surface. A lot of energy. Much more so than most people imagine. On average, thousands of times more solar energy strikes the Earth's surface per hour than all of the energy of all the types used by mankind in a year. Yeah, it's on average. Obviously, where you're at, it's dark half the time, so. But this is still a big deal. There's a lot of energy out there. And it's free. We have free access to it. That's good news. But then there's the bad news. We're not very good at utilizing that energy. We haven't had a real big reason for trying to utilize that energy to any large extent other than standing close to a warm rock uh, until really the last few decades. There's a wide variety or wide variation in the intensity of this energy. Look out there today. It's cloudy. Yesterday was sunny. A lot more energy yesterday from the sun than there is today, as far as what actually gets to the ground, and that's what we're concerned with. And last but definitely not least, the utilization of that energy isn't free. In fact, it can be very expensive. And technologically, can be a nightmare. But that's what we've got to work with. All right, photo cells. What are they? Photo cells, sometimes called solar cells. These are solid state electronic devices that convert light energy into electricity. Now, as you shine light on one of these components, you shine light on it and it produces a voltage. Not hooked up to any power source, just light strikes it. 
And these devices rely on a process called photovoltaic effect. The concept, the photovoltaic effect, that idea has been around for a long time. The concept's been around for over a century. A guy by the name of Becquerel first noticed this back in the late 1800s. Some of you science people may remember his name. But it was more of a curiosity than anything else. It was one of those deals where you had to hit this solar cell, or they didn't have a name for it back then, where you had to hit this with a whole lot of light and you got a little bitty voltage. No practical value was ever envisioned for them. Photocells finally found some practical use in the spa early space program, 1960s up into the 1970s. They were beginning to get their act together. Now, uh, a scientist in, in uh, Bell Labs <coughs> in the 1950s, Bell Labs uh, uh, was really a, a uh, major player in uh, electronics in the early days. Uh, now it's pretty, uh, pretty much relegated to lucent technologies, but anyhow, a scientist at Bell Labs in the 1950s, a scientist in his group, actually put together the first module of these. Again, it wasn't especially efficient. Well, it wasn't, just wasn't especially efficient. It wasn't efficient at all. It was less than 1%. But it was something to work with. So in the 1960s, they began to find some practical use for it. Now, photocells, solar cells, whatever, can be combined. When they are, you can combine them into a photovoltaic array, which is a group of specially connected photocells. There's one there. This is a small scale, of course, very small scale, but you have these various photocells lurking around. We use this as a trainer, but it fits the category. Photovoltaic are usually abbreviated PV. PV arrays, they are direct conversion of light to electricity. They're often categorized according to exactly which type of semiconductor technology is being used. Now here's what that's shooting at. Some of you are probably familiar uh, with some solid state technology, you know, you might not know that you are. Uh, some of you, who, maybe you have some uh, high performance stereos and you see the letters MOS on it or you actually see something that says MOSFET, M-O-S-F-E-T. That is a type of technology, that's MOSFET technology. Some, some of you may have encountered something like uh, a statement that says it's bipolar technology. This is, these two are completely different. They can be used to accomplish about the same thing, but they do it differently. The technology used here isn't along that line so much, but there are different types of technology. There's the so-called monocrystal, monocrystal in structure, polycrystal in structure. Not going into that, of course, but there are different technologies. And these technologies play a role in their cost, and how efficient they are. We're still not really efficient, but we're better than we used to be. <clears throat> and they're becoming less expensive. At one time, anything having to do with photovoltaics that produced any uh, reasonable value of power was kind of expensive. Well, they're still kind of expensive, but they're not as. Mass production. That's help. That helps with anything. Remember the plasma TVs when they came out? Any, or any of the high def TVs when they came out? They were very expensive. They're still kind of expensive, but the price has dropped significantly. More and more people are buying them. Mass production. The technology is getting better. We're better now at creating these than we used to be. Well, we've had plenty of time to work on them. 
We're better at it. As of now, though, the cost of one of these things is about three to five dollars per watt of electricity. And that's if you include installation. Now, if you're not familiar with the terminology of a watt, a watt is a measure of electrical power. You've heard of 100 watt light bulbs or 1,000 watt heating elements or something like that. That's the same watt. So, three to five dollars per watt. It's still kind of high, you know, to run that 100 watt light bulb. You're talking three to five hundred dollars. More on that. Conversion efficiency, this is simply, a, the term conversion efficiency just uh, refers to a measure of how much uh, power we can get out of this versus how much power went into it. It's getting better. Right now though, typical real world, this is, this is not the ones on the, uh, on the drawing board, this is not the ones in the labs, this is the ones actually out there that you could go buy if you wanted. Typical real world values, as of now, 10 to 25 percent efficient. And the variation, that wide variation, again, goes back to this technology. Uh, you know, it's not, this, this type is not as, not as efficient, but it's also not as costly. And so if cost is your major issue, maybe you go that route. But 10 to 25 percent efficiency. This isn't too good, really, if you, don't, if, you, if you lose sight of the fact that the energy that's hitting it is free. This is about the same, minor variations, but this is about the same as the efficiency of that gizmo you drove over here in. And we've worked for decades to try to increase the efficiency of that. Anyhow, university lab models right now, and this is where it, this is where it a lot of the, the research goes on, of course. Obviously, some of the, some of the major uh, uh, industries, Siemens Corporation, GE, that kind of thing, they have the money, they have the capital to throw into the, the research. They have the uh, incentive to throw into this research. Uh, but laboratory, university labs, you know, the scientific community, these are the ones that are doing, that are doing the work on this. Notice that I've got universal laboratory models claiming to exceed 40% efficiency. I italicized the word claiming there for a reason. When this, and I, I, I get in my inbox newsletters by the dozens, probably on a, on a weekly basis, on various items concerning alternative energy, but it, this. And they line, when this first, this first came out, skeptics lined up at the door. Now, you, can't, you cannot possibly have that kind of efficiency. It can't be done. Uh, there is a, without getting too far in depth here, there is a theoretical limit on a monocrystalline structure. And that 25% above that, the 25% is getting real close to it. Theoretical limit meaning that there's nothing you can do to get an efficiency any higher than that. It's a limit. So they, there were some real skeptics, but as I'll show you a little bit later how they pulled this off. And they have apparently pulled it off. But when this first came out, they actually hadn't even built it yet. All right, characteristics of these things. If you were to go online to try to buy one of these, or if you go to your local <laughs> photovoltaic array discount house. They're typically going to be sold as a function of power or maybe energy capability. So they might be sold uh, in terms of watts or in case of energy, kilowatt hours. Now kilowatt hours, if you're not familiar with that term, actually you probably are familiar with it, you just don't recall it. That's what you pay for in your light bill. Or you pay your light bill is based on some number of kilowatt hours. So sometimes you'll see these things sold uh, in terms of their power capability, watts, kilowatt hours, sometimes nominal values, uh, voltage and current capability, but these are the most common. 
Then you'll see something sometimes called an open circuit voltage or short circuit current. Open circuit voltage is where there's, there's no current being drawn from the thing. It's kind of like, uh, imagine your car battery. Uh, and you've taken, the, you've taken the cables loose in the car battery and you set it out on the, on the garage floor. And you take your handy dandy voltmeter and you just measure across the terminals of that. And there's no real current being drawn. That's open circuit. Open circuit voltage. So they're sold sometimes as a function of that. As soon as any current starts to flow, that voltage will drop. But they sell it as open circuit. It gives you a starting point. And short circuit current. Now you can't, you, well you can, but you're not supposed to do this with your car battery. Just think about it. Don't really do it. If you were to short the terminals together, there would be a huge value of current flow. That would be a short circuit current. Again, don't do that because it will probably blow up your face. Physical dimensions are also important. Look at this. Look how big this is. This has a whopping 70 to 75 watt capability. That wouldn't run the 100 watt light bulb. And look how big it is. And think about in your house, in your home, whatever. Think about the electrical power that you're using. If you have an electric water heater, it's probably equipped with heating elements that draw 4,500 watts each. 70 to 75 watts. <coughs> Actually, we live, we, our homes are, are power hogs. Uh, some of us learned, learned that um, during the ice storm. When you, you uh, went out and got your handy dandy 5,000 watt portable generator and find out it, would, it didn't run too much in the house. Well anyhow, physical dimensions can be important. Photo cell technology, again, may also be an issue. It depends on how much money you want to spend. Once you've gotten these, and you can cascade them, much like batteries. You can, you can, you know, you, if you think about a flashlight, uh, most flashlights uh, have uh, more than one battery, two batteries. They, in fact, some, bat some flashlights are even sold as a function of how many cells they have, a two cell, a three cell, a five cell. Those batteries are connected, usually connected in series with each other, which means they're, sta they're, they're in line. They're, they're designed to increase the total voltage. Each of those little batteries probably run a volt and a half. You put two of them in there, you got twice a volt and a half. You got three. And you, you keep going up. So these things can be cascaded to increase their voltage. The same, the, the same concept with the batteries, but instead of increasing the voltage, you want to increase how much current the total system can produce. You can put them into what's called parallel. And they have the same 1.5 volt value, but now they produce two, three, whatever, um, times the amount of current that they would have for a single one. So these things can be cascaded. They can be in series, they can be in parallel, or some combination thereof to enhance voltage and current capability. Here's one that sneaks up on people sometimes until it, it uh, reaches out and bites them. Safety is a major concern, of course, with, with anything having to do with this, with electrical for that matter. Especially if the PV arrays have output voltages in excess of 40 volts or so, which some do. That one doesn't, but some do. And it comes when you're trying to install them. Now, if you were going to try to install a light switch or a receptacle in your home, you'd turn off the power. <laughs> you, you can't turn those off. Uh, if you're out in the daylight, there's sunlight, probably. Even if it is diffused through the clouds, there's some. So you got two options. One is you could work at night. That's probably not the best option. But you could work at night and hope the 
hope the spectrum of the, of the shop lights you were using didn't uh, uh, fall into the, into the groove for what they're looking for. But the other, other point is you could cover them. Now most people figure out this second one pretty soon. It may be after they've gotten, they probably, you're probably not going to get electrocuted with it, but you might get burned. You probably do more damage, especially if you're trying to mount them on the roof. You probably do more damage in the fall from the roof, uh, but it is something to think about. And something else to think about. This is an electrical device. Installation should adhere to the National Electric Code guidelines and probably should be installed by qualified electricians trained in PV installation. You may not have a choice on this, incidentally. It might be that the National, the National Electric Code actually has, has a section in it on photovoltaic arrays and all the rules and regulations that go with it. And whether or not your particular area uh, it, uh, requires that to be inspected just depends. Now, if you're in the city of Paducah, it's going to have to be inspected. Okay, a little more technical now. When these things are rated, you know, I said 70 to 75 watts and, and some of them 40 volts or more. When these things are rated, there are several rating schemes that they use, but two items that usually show up for most photovoltaic arrays is what's called insolation, not insolation, insolation, which is a measure of how much energy is actually reaching the Earth's surface at any given instant in time. These are usually rated at about a, uh, a scale of about a thousand watts per square meter. In other words, in, in a laboratory rating, they have the ability to hit these PVs with a light source that simulates sunlight at a thousand watts per square meter. That doesn't mean that when you drag them out the door into the sunlight, they're going to actually have that. But that's what they're rated at, 1,000 watts per square meter. And something called an air mass 1.5 spectrum. Simply put, here's what that means. Sunlight travels from the sun to the earth, but it, it enters the earth's atmosphere. As it enters the earth's atmosphere, some of it is reflected, some is refracted, etc. Fancy way of saying not all of it gets to the ground. If you are standing out in the middle of somewhere and the sun is, it's noon, the sun is directly overhead, perfectly overhead. The light energy is said to move through one atmosphere. Now, it doesn't take much of an uh, observation to realize that the sun is, is very rarely straight overhead. In fact, between uh, summer and winter, it moves back and forth in the southern hemisphere, or in the southern sky. So what they've done is rated how much sunlight would come, uh, make it through the atmosphere on a good day if the angle between vertical and over in the southern part, I don't know if that's south or not, but it is now. This angle is about 48 degrees. And they say at that point, the light will have to have traveled through about 1.5 atmospheres. 1.5 times the length that they would have had to gone through straight overhead. So almost all of them, well, I'll remove that, almost. All of them in the northern hemisphere are rated AM 1.5. <laughs> Uh, some of them in uh, some other parts of the world are rated a little bit differently, but you know, around here most of them are 1.5. But these can be deceiving. Again, 75 watts. That's only on a really, really good day. If it's hazy, like it is here in July sometimes, won't get that. On a day like today, it won't get hardly anything. 
Remember, it's rated at 1,000 watts per square meter. On a day like today, you would be lucky, really lucky, to get 100 watts per square meter out there. And of course, if it's really, really heavy duty overcast, it drops from there. So these ratings may be a little bit deceiving. The reason I mention that is because it's very easy to go out and uh, get this wild notion to put your house on, on uh, uh, solar panels and go strictly by the number of watts, or number of kilowatt hours, something or other, and then you're disappointed when it doesn't uh, live up to your expectations. You have to, there's, it's, there's more to it than just sticking one of these things up and powering it up. You have to, you have to do a little bit of research on it. David? Yes? What about ambient air temperature? Temperature does affect it, uh, uh, and I'll mention something about this a little bit later, but yes, temperature does affect it, and it's kind of a catch-22, because everybody thinks about uh, PVs as being the most useful in Yuma, Arizona or something, you know, something like that. And they are, of course, they get more sunlight in Yuma, Arizona than they do in Paducah, Kentucky. But the actual value of voltage that each of these cells produce and thus the value of voltage that the, the whole array can produce is temperature dependent. And, and again, ironically, the voltage goes down the warmer it gets. Your stereos do the same thing, but, but they've corrected for that. They haven't figured out a way to correct for this yet. But it will produce. Now, how much less? Well, it, it, it just depends on how hot they get. And some of the large ones that you see on TV, the pictures and so forth, some of those actually have cooling systems. Literally, in, in, in many cases, an ethylene glycol cool, uh, uh, antifreeze cooling system to try to keep the cells from, from getting too warm. But yeah, it does. It does affect it. Okay, two major categories of these things. Off-grid and on-grid, or sometimes grid type. All right, a grid. The utility companies, the power companies, their wires, their generators, their transform, all their gadgetry, that which you plug your television or your coffee pot or whatever into, that is referred to collectively as the power grid. It's what we lost in the ice storm. So there's two categories, off-grid, on-grid systems. Off-grid system, <laughs> you might have figured this one out, it's not connected to the power grid at all. It's completely independent, absolutely no connection. Solar-powered yard lights are an example. Yeah, the highway department even uses uh, uh, solar panels sometimes to power some of their, their signs on the road. Or they're out in the middle of, of nowhere and there's no connection to the power grid. It's also useful when standard gr grid connections aren't possible, such as a cabin in the mountains. Now, the off-grid systems uh, this is usually not what people are thinking about, at least not in today's world, when they think about uh, photovoltaic. They usually think about on-grid. This is connected to the AC power grid. And this type system is usually designed to supplement the AC grid. Now here's the way the thought process goes. You figure out, right, I've got these photovoltaic arrays out here in the yard or on the roof or wherever they're at and they're producing X amount of power. And I'm running part of my home off of that X amount of power. So that amount of power, whatever it is, I don't have to buy from the power company. That's what I mean by supplementing the power grid. No one in this case, using it for this, no one ever assumes that those arrays, those, those solar panels, are going to take the place of the power grid. They're just going to help it. And this brings up the idea of 
net metering. One step farther from just supplementing the AC grid, it didn't take people long to figure out that, well, there's going to be times, really bright sunny day, and I don't have much turned on in the house, either by, uh, by uh, uh, accident or by deliberate design. I don't have anything turned on in the house, so I'm actually generating, I actually have the capability of generating power much more than I would draw from the power grid. So, I'll sell it back to the power company. And you hear this on TV, so, and there's a law that says they have to, have to buy this. Well, there is a law, but the law only covers certain power companies, first of all. It doesn't usually cover uh, rural co-ops or, or something like that. And so whether they choose to buy it back from you or not is up to them. A lot of them will, but they may not be legally bound to. And then there's the idea of, what? They're going to buy it back from me. How much are they going to pay? Are they going to pay what I pay them? Maybe. Maybe not. They may sell it to you retail and buy it from you wholesale. And that, there is no law covering that. That's their call. So, check with the power company. And as strange as it sounds, the power company is very willing to work with you on this. All right. The people who have had me in class, uh, particularly circuits and uh, thyristors, know that I'm a big fan of block diagrams. <coughs> Typical off-grid layout. One block in that off-grid layout will be the array, of course, the photovoltaic array. And this will be a combination of these things and it may occupy all the way across the front of this room or something. But there's, there's going to be that block. Now, because these things produce a lot of energy, or as much as they're going to, in bright sunny conditions, but obviously don't produce anything at night and produce very little in clouds, you've got to have, or you probably want to have, some way of taking advantage of the high uh, energy output for times of darkness, for times of clouds. So you have to have some kind of storage system. Although there are other ways of doing it, the, the uh, method of choice is usually <coughs> batteries. Let the solar panels charge batteries while, the so while there's a lot of sun. Let the solar panel charge the batteries. Then, when the sun goes away, take the energy off the batteries. That's the way the uh, thought process runs. And of course, or maybe not of course, but you got to charge. When they charge these batteries, there has to be some way of, of controlling that charge. You can't just haul off and hook, hook the photovoltaic array to a battery because the, the output of the, of the, of the PV the voltage output will fluctuate up and down all over the place and batteries hate that. So you got to have something called a charge controller. <laughs> it controls the charge. They weren't too original in the naming of this. Charge controller. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But charge controller. Its function in life, or one of its main functions, is to charge the battery. It actually has another function we'll talk about in a minute, but it's charge the battery. But then here's a new block, a power inverter. This may not be needed, it just depends on what you're trying to do here. But a power inverter is a device that takes DC power, like from a battery or something, and converts it into AC. Now if you've ever uh, done any camping or you know someone has an RV or something, uh, you know that you can buy these gizmos at the uh, Best Buy and all the, all the grab-all stores uh, that you connect to your battery and it'll let you run your coffee pot or something. Well, that's on a very small scale compared to what this is, but the purpose of this is to convert the DC into AC. Because in your home, think about it, most if not all of your electrical loads, and a load is anything that uses electricity, 
Most, if not all, of your electrical loads are AC. Television, whatever, they're AC. They're designed to plug in. Occasionally you'll find some DC loads. Or if you're in that magical cabin up in the Rocky Mountains, all of your loads may be DC, and that's the reason I stuck that parenthetical statement in there, that power inverter may not be needed. If you don't need AC, you don't need the inverter. But if you've got to have AC, you've got to have the inverter. So here's the energy flow. The photovoltaic array supplies a DC value. Now again, DC is direct current. Current only flows in one direction, it's like a battery. Supplies DC to a charge controller. The charge controller supplies DC to a battery. You can't charge a battery with, with AC. It's got to be DC. The battery, of course, supplies DC. But then the inverter supplies AC to the final loads. So the output of the inverter is where you'd plug in your lamps or your toasters or whatever. And then I put in some dashed lines because some charge controllers are, this in fact most of them these days, are designed to be able to power the inverter directly in case the batteries are fully charged and the, and the arrays are still producing something. And I've shown a dashed line from the battery bank to the loads block simply to indicate that if you have only DC loads you can come right off the, right off the battery. This is a typical off-grid layout. We'll look at it on-grid in a minute, but it's almost the same as this. Now it gets a little better. Batteries. Several different types of batteries that are used with these things. There's the NICAD that can be used. And each of these have advantages, but there's the lithium-based cells that can be used with these. And then there's the lead acid types. Lead acid types are, uh, although it's a modified type, but think about your car battery. That's, a, that's actually a lead acid type. Of these three, the lead acid is the winner by default. It's the most popular overall because of its, first of all, its availability and well understood what's called cycling characteristics. A cycle in a battery is loosely defined as you start with a given level of charge, say it's fully charged, given level of charge, you discharge it down to 75% or something and then recharge it back to where it started. That's one cycle. The cycling characteristics of, of lead acid batteries are a little bit better understood, a little bit easier to control than some of those others. However, the lead acid battery, sometimes called an SLI for starting, lighting, and ignition, is not the best choice for a PV system. This type of battery is designed to produce large values of current for a short period of time and has a relatively shallow cycle. It li that, that type of battery likes to, for you to get in the car, hit the starter, drain it down to say 80%, engine fires, all in air brings it back up to near 100%. It likes that. That type of battery does not like to be discharged down to 10 or 20 percent and then brought back up. It doesn't like that. It won't take that very long. That's why they call it a shallow cycle type. The deep cycle batteries are really a better choice for this. Whereas the car battery type is designed to produce large, hundreds of amps perhaps, hard, uh, large values of current for a short period of time while the engine's starting. The deep cycle is designed to produce small to medium values of current over extended periods of time. If you have any experience with, with uh, deep cycle, it's probably with a trolling motor and bass boats and stuff. That, a lot of those are deep cycle. Uh, golf cart batteries are oftentimes a deep cycle type. But your car battery usually is not, uh, particularly if you just go to an par auto parts store to buy one. The deep cycle batteries are designed to withstand deep cycling. Start at 100% charge, discharge down to 20% and then be charged back up to 100%. They're designed to withstand that kind of cycling. But they do better if they're shallow cycled as much as you can get away with. 
The deep cycle battery is usually rated in terms of amp hours as opposed to uh, the ratings that you may be accustomed to seeing on your car, CCA for cold cranking amps and MCA for marine cranking amps. The CCA value is usually a big number, 800 amps, 1000 amps, something like that. MCA may even be bigger. Amp hours, you might see 100 amp hours or 200 amp hours or something or other like that. This rating is a way, it's usually based on like a, a 20 hour period. This is a way of talking about how much current the battery can produce over a 20 hour period, continuous current. And there's no reason to have that for a car battery. But it is very big reasons for having for these. There are variations for this type. Flooded cell, absorbed glass mat, AGM, gelled electrolyte. All these will work. All these are deep cycle and all of them will work. The last one is not being used so much anymore because it, it has to be charged very slowly and there may not be enough sun during the day to charge it. The flooded cell is kind of like your car battery. It does require maintenance and cleaning. It might require addition, depending on what kind it is, it might require uh, that you add water to it occasionally. The AGM is a maintenance free type but it's still expensive. It can, be, it can actually be oriented in, in uh, uh, any, any fashion. I, they don't usually see them mounted upside down but they can be mounted sideways or, or whatever whereas the flooded cell can't be. All these are deep cycle. Deep cycle batteries typically cost substantially more than a standard SLI. You can go to uh, AutoZone or Advance or whatever and probably get a, car, a battery for your car for $80 or $90. Granted, some of these places have batteries that they claim are deep cycle and they cost about $100, $110. They're probably not deep cycle uh, because they've redefined, the manufacturer has redefined what he meant by deep cycle. Typically batteries that are going to be used for these things are going to be anywhere on average anywhere from three to six hundred dollars each and I saw one just this afternoon on, on the, the internet. Now it's, it had a high amp hour rating no doubt but the bat, one battery was fifteen hundred dollars. And they're heavy. This fifteen hundred dollar battery weighed nearly three hundred pounds. They're big. Typical voltage for complete systems, 12, 24, and 48. Oddly enough, 48 is becoming the uh, preferred value. Trust me on this. The higher the voltage, the smaller the wires that you need. There's a reason for it, but it's just smaller. Same reason you might go to a, to a higher voltage electric motor in your shop. Charge controller, used to charge the batteries, I already said that. This determines the rate of charge, or excuse me, yeah, the rate of charge based on battery type. Didn't mention that, but these three batteries, the flooded cell and the AGM and uh, so forth, they can't be charged the same way. You try to charge one with the method that the other uses and you'll destroy it. So these charge controllers, these smart charge controllers that we have these days, figure out what you've got. Either automatically figure it out or they literally have a toggle switch for the human to figure out and put it in the right position. And they usually run in three stages. Bulk, absorption, and float. You may have battery chargers at home to do this. Never knew what to call it. On a bulk charge, char when you first, the battery is first connected to this thing, charging current goes to a maximum and the voltage rises to some predetermined value set by the manufacturer. Once that value is reached, that predetermined value of voltage is maintained and the bulk value of current tapers off. And finally it goes to a trickle mode or sometimes called float mode. Just hauling, you know, some of you that are uh, older here may remember back in the 70s and 80s when battery chargers pretty much uh, was a big transformer and a rectifier 
and you stuck it across the terminals and it, the only, all it had a power resistor to limit the current. And you just waited around for a little while and the battery charged up. You try that these days, even on the one you got in your car, and you're likely to severely shorten its life. They won't take that. Uh, your bat, on your car these, if you got a car younger than about 10 years, uh, your, car, your battery these days is being charged under, under computer control when you start the engine. These things recognize when the battery is fully charged, and again, as I said a while ago, they may then provide input current directly to the inverter if the PVs are still receiving adequate sunlight. Very sophisticated. Inverter, DC to power to AC power. Residential applications, usually designed to use output voltage of 120 volts AC or maybe 240 slash 120. But you can get these for industrial uh, applications, but for residential, pretty much it. Three different types. The good ones, that's the ones that cost a lot, are sine wave output. Now I'll show you what a sine wave looks like in a minute. This is the most desirable type. It's also the most expensive. It produces a sine wave with a low total harmonic distortion that rivals or even exceeds the power grid waveform. Modified sine wave, usually noticeably different in terms of shape. High wave harmonic distortion. Least desirable square wave causes problems with certain electronic circuits, particularly timing circuits. Here's a sine wave. This is what, if you were to take a gizmo called an oscilloscope, don't try this without some advice, but if you were to try this with an oscilloscope, the waveform that you would get out of an AC outlet in your home is going to look just about like this. It's going to climb to a maximum value of about 170 volts, go down to a minimum value of about a negative 170 volts, back up to zero over and over and over again. You get 60 of those every second, 60 cycle. That's what the sine wave output should look like. That's what the power grid looks like. That's what the output of the inverter should look like if everything's going to work correctly in your home. Here's the worst case. That's a square wave. This is really hard on motors. It's hard on timing circuits. It's hard on control boards, circuit boards, like in televisions. You know, even a washing machine anymore has got circuit boards in it. Really hard on those. You don't see those sold much anymore, but when you do, the reason they're sold and the reason people buy them is they're pretty cheap. So anyhow, sine wave is pretty much becoming the norm after they figured out how to do it. It's pretty much becoming the norm. Here's a grid tile I'll run through this because the block diagram is almost the same. The grid tie has about the same blocks except for that one. The switcher. Here's what supposed, that's supposed to do. When the solar cells are doing their thing in the middle of the day, you're powering all your load and so forth and you don't need the power grid at all. As the sun begins to go down and the output of the rays diminish, begin to diminish, there will be a point reached where the output of the inverter will stop because the input voltage from the charge controller and the battery bank will drop below a set point on the input of the power inverter. That instructs the power inverter to either tell the switcher, or I've got to have probably part of the inverter itself, instruct it to switch in the AC grid. Now this sounds simple. This really sounds simple. You know, do that with a mechanical switch. No, you can't do that. The power company is really, really picky about who connects to their grid. They don't want some square wave thing being applied to their grid. That's got to be a good looking sine wave. It also has to be in sync with the voltages. Uh, in other words, you won't want to hit the, you won't want to turn a switch that make this switch when the 
uh, photovoltaic was at its maximum value voltage and the power grid was on that negative swing. If you do, you're going to tear something up. And it's not going to be the power grid. So they're real picky. For that reason, the switcher, the power inverter, they may all be in one unit, and it's called a, a grid tie inverter. This inverter has microprocessor control. It recognizes when the need for the grid uh, occurs, and it also carries out the synchronization process. So it's seamless. You don't notice the difference. But that has to happen. Anyhow, that's the idea of an on-grid. Here's the downside. All these blocks, all these things put together. The complete systems are actually very expensive when compared to connection to standard power grids. A recent advertisement shown to me by one of my AET students lists a 5,000 watt system that sold for over $21,000. And this doesn't include installation, hardware, or freight charges. Installation could be a big issue. So can the hardware. And the freight charge, you're, you're talking hundreds of dollars at least there. 5,000 watts. Remember the water heater element, 4,500 watts? This would barely run your water heater on a good day. However, there's sources of funding help available. The federal government has low interest loans available for projects like this. There's also green incentives, tax breaks, that kind of thing that can be used, people are utilizing. And again, strangely enough, even power companies are sometimes willing to help with a residential project. It's got to be an individual. They won't help a business. It's got to be an individual. But the first time you hear that, it's that, well, isn't that kind of counterproductive? Isn't that kind of dumb for a power company to help with a photovoltaic setup when you're you're fixing to, when their, their job is to sell you power and they're, they're giving you a loan so that you can create your own? <sighs> right now the power company knows that you're not going to put them out of business with this. And two things. Number one, the power company is forever being plagued by something called peak demand particularly in the summer, July, August, and it's about 150 in the shade, and everybody's got their air conditioners wound up. The power company is doing everything it can to keep up. And so they have to lay out money to come up with uh, what they call peaking, and that's P-E-A-K, peaking generators. If they could count on some people well, they have to count on several people, but they could count on some people that during this hot part of the day, that's when the sun's out. During this hot part of the day, if, they could, uh, if these people could use maybe the, the PV arrays to just handle the normal lighting, they're probably not going to be able to handle the air conditioning, but you handle the normal lighting. Well, this reduces the load on the company. Saves them money. Also, kind of a dirty little secret, the power company would like to get in on this. You know, like, well, their oil companies like to get in on this. They are in on this. The power companies are not above letting the individuals set up their PV array and make all the mistakes, make all the corrections, get everything in order, and they won't have to make those same mistakes. Companies do that a lot. Automotive people do that. Let the individuals, let the experimenters play with it. Get all the bugs worked out of the system. So power companies do, show, do step up every now and then. On the horizon, what's coming? Efficiency and size improvements. A design that until recently hadn't been considered for consumer use is now on the verge of becoming a reality. That design uh, was being used in the, in the uh, uh, spacecrafts and so forth I was talking about. Triple junction solar cell. The triple junction simply means that it's using three solid state, they call them junctions, three solid state junctions instead of just one. 
One solid state junction that they've been using, like it's on this array here, produces a value of electricity that is predominantly the result of one color light. Uh, it's kind of a, a yellowish color. They figured out a way to take advantage of three colors, red, green, and blue. So they have one junction that is very sensitive to red, one junction that's very sensitive to blue, another junction that's very sensitive to green. Uh, any of you into TV uh, trivia probably realize that that's where we got our color TV images for many years, was red, green, and blue. They even called it RGB, RGB drive on the, on the TV. Well, they've come up with a slick trick for creating three junctions and taking advantage of a much wider spectrum of the visible light. So that, see on the, on the, on the older design, you hit it with a lot of light, but you only, it only used part of it. Now it's using more of it. Plus, they're using light intensifiers. Uh, that's a, any of you ever used a magnifying glass to start a fire? I mean to heat up something. <laughs> that's a light intensifier. They can use light intensifiers on these to dramatically increase the amount of light that's actually striking it. So, for if you look at light striking the top of the intensifier, time the intensifier gets through concentrating it and is taking advantage of the three colors involved, the efficiency now actually is about 40 percent for those. Now, it's, on, it, it's here. NASA uses it. It's a little while before we get to money. This is extremely expensive. And, going back to your question, John, cooling may be required. Because when you, you know, the magnifying glass with the fire, well now you've got a big magnifying glass shining on these, so they never get hot. So they have to be protected. But it's coming. That's something that's coming. And of course, as efficiency improves and physical size diminishes, they'll become more cost effective and more people will buy them and that further reduces the cost, kind of a vicious cycle. What now? If you're considering getting a photovoltaic system for your home, here's some things to think about. Do you have the room? They're big. Now, some people put on, on the roofs of their home, but it covers most of the roof. Some people literally do not have enough real estate to put a PV array up that will power their home. If you only have, you know, a quarter of an acre, you'll have enough room for this. Are you comfortable with the aesthetics? <laughs> Imagine this thing 10 or 15 times as big sticking in your yard or on your roof. Are you happy with that? Some people will say, well, that's, that's, that's good, for the, good for the environment. Okay. Some people say, I wouldn't have that on a bed. So, that's something you have to ask. On grid or off grid? Difference in money there. Talk to the power company. The power company can be a valuable asset in this. Again, it doesn't seem like it would, but they can. Sizing and pricing. Here are some couple websites uh, that, and I'm not pushing these websites, all right. Uh, but Wholesale Solar is a typical website that provides info on sizing, prices, equipment, even complete systems. Uh, Green Power Global Technology. Actually, that's the Green Power Global Technology is. Uh, uh, where the student had priced that, that uh, 5,000 water ray that he mentioned. But it's another, it's another popular website, and there are many out there, but these two just come to mind. Uh, pretty easy to navigate. And they even have uh, explanations of some things. You know, here's, here's our ratings, and here's what these ratings mean, and here's why we rate them this way, and, and so forth. Yeah. Thank you.